Hey everybody, this is Birch. While we're all talking about the comic business and who's making money and who isn't, this seems like a good question to answer. It says, what is the number of orders for a comic to be profitable? Mail goes, Perch, I want to know what point, what is the point that a comic at the big two becomes profitable for Marvel and DC? Is there usually a common break even point for orders with the expectation of a higher profile of talent? Of course, what's the probability profitability for indie comics? Okay. So uh, this there's not one answer. So let me put this out there. It doesn't mean that you know you can weasel out on the answer, it just means kind of as you alluded to in your mail, there's a lot of different ways that you cut that. You know, you, you basically make that that happen. So a couple of those factors are the price point. For example, if you are selling a book for $25, like a lot of crowdfunded books, um, your profitability, your break-even point is, uh, you know, the amount of units that you have to sell is a lot lower than if your comic is, you know, $3.99. So if you're going to, you know, break even at $25, you know, you may need to sell 500 or so, I mean, just some, some amount, and that you'll, you'll break even, assuming that your costs are down. I mean, there's, there's, again, the other factor is, what are you doing? Is it black and white? Is it printed on heavy card stock? How many pages is it worth? How much are you paying the creative team? On and on it goes. How are you distributing it? There's lots of different ways to do this. And keep in mind, like, for example, a lot of crowdfunded books, you know, when they sell things like a signed, you know, signed cover for $50 or merchandise or whatever else, several people who have done the crowdfunding approach have basically leveraged the, that merchandise to augment the, the comic. So basically, maybe if it was a comic alone, they're losing money or break even, but the profitability margin goes up because you charge $50 for a hat where the hat costs you $4 to make, you know, I mean, so there's, there's, there's a variety of factors here that affects profitability. But let's say, let's, let's break it down this way. For the big two, profitability for a long time, true profitability, and keep in mind, you said profit. You didn't say success. And because there are definitely some people in the comments who like to be really blunt about this, um, let me explain that if you paid you know, if, if you basically, your outlay of cash was $15,000 and you made 15000 and one penny, you are profitable. You made a penny. Now, if you want to get funny about it, you can talk about the tax and, you know, all, you know there's, there's lots of other little factors there. But, okay, one penny equals profit. Now, nobody would say that's good. And sometimes when I say, yeah, the comic business is profitable, people will say, and I've seen people, I've seen uh, one jackass who likes to snipe the videos and do dumbass little live streams on it with his, you know, inbred audience, likes to make comments like, oh, so Perch says everything is great. And it always drives me crazy because it's so fucking disingenuous that anyone in their right mind, and of course the audience is not, uh, you know, would see it for what it is, which is bullshit. But anyway, sorry. Uh, but but basically, making one pity of profit is technically profit. But you're not, I mean, that's not good. You're not sitting there super thrilled about your one penny, and you certainly can't live off of one penny. And keep in mind, profitability isn't a living wage. So, for example, if you did a crowdfunded book, and you spent a year making it, and you made, I don't know, $500, you're profitable. Now, you can't live off $500, you know, as a human being, so you're probably going to have a pretty shitty life or maybe you're augmenting with some other job, whatever. But anyway, that's that's the difference there. So at the big two, to historically, profitability has sat at roughly 14,000 copies sold. Now you might go, holy shit, that's a low number. And you're correct. Um, some people have said profitability sits at 30,000, 40,000 mark. No, actually, it's, it's about 14,000. You got the economy of scale based on the fact that so many books are, are moving through. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways that you get to that number. It's about 14,000 is a general rule of thumb that the big two have used. The companies, I have no idea what they tell the artists, but that's what they've used. Now, that's not success by any stretch of imagination because you can't actually, uh, you, you've just covered your costs. So that, that's, not, that's not a good business. You know, you have no profit, you have no money to sink into other things, and that's really dirt cheap talent, uh, you know, no big names, no, no I mean, nothing. You're, you're, you're running a thin margin. So that's about it. Typically, what the big two have used over the last, I, I don't know, 10 years, they've used 30,000 
as the kind of bellwether and general mark. And 30,000 means it's worth we continue to do this. And under 30,000 means, you know, there's a high chance this dips into unprofitability or at least it becomes an opportunity cost where if we changed around the creative team or the concept or the story or something, we can make more money. So therefore, opportunity cost basically means, yeah, you may be profitable now, but if you're applying the same effort and time and, and energy to something different, you would, uh, you know, you'd make twice as much. So therefore, even though you're profitable, you're, you're losing money in the opportunity cost because you could be making more with what you're doing because you, you do not have infinite time. You don't have infinite resources. So therefore, is this the best bet you can play? And making a penny on, you know, your investment is not, the, not a great bet. So about 30000 is what they've used. Now, for the indie market, it's very different. For the indie market, oftentimes uh, people will say it's profitable if it gets to ah, 5,000, 6,000 copies. Now, there may be some other kind of random variables in there, but keep in mind the talent is typically paid less. The upside, you know, there, There's a bunch of other factors, but typically about 5,000, 6,000 has been a, a general bellwether for success. Or sorry, for profitability, different from success. Success at the indie world, you do over 12,000 starts to be good. But again, there's other factors that come into play for both indie and for the big two. And this is, this is a, another huge factor because if you're just looking at Comicron numbers or something like that, and you see 12,000, you might think to yourself, well, maybe this is profitable, but it's, it, nobody's making any money off this. It's just, it's covering costs and that's not good. Well, what you need to pass into there are, yes, there's digital sales, and digital sales have typically for the last several years ranged between 8 and 12% of physical. So, you know, basically, general math, if you've got uh, 12,000 copies that are sold, you're selling 1,200 digital copies. Now, it's a bit of a misnomer because there's a, a bit of a bell curve that goes on with digital, where the more popular books tend to index higher in that range to about 12%, and the lower range books, the ones that are uh, not doing as well, tend to go 8% and below, and sometimes much below. So it, it, when you get to one of the lower books, and all bets tend to be off, and you get kind of very different results at times. But you have digital, which, which can be, you know, the comic publishers often see as free money, which I wish they didn't, because if they didn't see it as free money, they might actually invest some energy into it. And then you have trade sales, and then you might have licensing deals, and you might have attached deals, and you might, there's a bunch of Kind of, uh, there's a bunch of other ways that factor into this. So, for example, like I mentioned in another video, you sell the license to Miss Marvel. You've got a Disney Plus show. So that show's coming out. And what happens is Disney will fish around to Target, to toy makers, to fast food places, all these different locations and say, you know, we've got licenses. You want to, you know, you want to you take part and use this to promote your book. This is going to, in theory, help your product as well. We got Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel, uh, you know, is if the really popular licenses, they can just say you pay into it, and you get to use the likeness as character. You're going to do a book about it or whatever you're you're doing, whatever, whatever you're licensing the, the property. And if the if the property is not as popular, and you're seeing more and more of these, so back when Avengers One, Avengers Two came out, I remember there were they they were doing licensing deals with no recoupable. So that, that basically means a recoupable is when you do a deal and you say, I'm going to pay you $100,000 for this license. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, do whatever I want with it. I'm going to, well, not whatever I want, but I'm going to make a board game. Why not? We'll, we'll be real old fashioned. I'm going to make a board game. And the first 100000 that I make off this board game is all mine. That's called a recoupable. You're recouping your investment. And then after I make hundred thousand, I'm going to split the every dollar I get after that 50-50 with you. Now these deals are pretty popular, and they're pretty uh, they're they're very common in licensing deals. You do a recoupable license deal. Um, what happens when a pop, uh, you know a product is super super popular is you typically do not have any recoupability because the licensor, in this case Disney, could demand. Hey, we know the Avengers is super popular. We know there are lots of people out here who would like to license it. So you pay a hundred thousand, and uh, we take fifty-fifty from the very beginning. There's no recouping that money. That a hundred thousand is just pay to play. But we, you know, are, we're banking on the fact this property is so popular that you're going to make money to basically, you know, cover your uh, what you paid in. And that is, you know, that's that's again, that's a very 
popular way to do things. That's a very, you know, it, when, when the Avengers 1 and 2 were out, there were a lot of deals being made that way. The world is not that way now. Things have cooled in the licensing deal. So we're kind of back to recoupables and we're back to incentive deals. So an incentive deal in this case is what I've talked about before, which is, hey, you know, one, you pay a license and in return, we'll do these things for you. We'll help market, we'll cross promote, and we'll publish a comic. And believe it or not, no matter what you think about the quality of the comic, it's, it's, it's a, it is very popular because the way they'll do the math, the way they'll put this out in front of a licensor is they'll say, hey, we publish, you know, this Miss Marvel comic, for example, uh, sells over 100,000 copies a year. That number sounds impressive. Now, if you've been, you know, focusing on comic sales, you've been watching Comicron, that number is actually not that impressive because if you're doing a monthly comic, 100,000 copies of Miss Marvel in a year, that's, you know, 8,000, that's 8,000 a month. That, that sucks. But that's not the, the person who's buying the license is just seeing this as cross marketing. They don't have to pay for it. They don't, they're not thinking about it. So they're going, okay, this is just one more thing that's going to help boost the popularity of this thing that I'm doing. So cool. 100,000 copies. That sounds impressive to me. Go for it. It's not a scam, but it, it, is a, it is a, you know, kind of slanted way of looking at the business. So when you talk about comic books and, and what makes them profitable, you count the copies sold, which we talked about. You talk about, are they tied into any license deals or anything else that helps boost that money? Or is there trade sales? Are there graphic novel sales? Are there digital sales? That's the all-in, that's the all-in amount. Now, oftentimes, by the way, because sometimes the uh, comic creators, people in comics, will say things like, uh, oh, but... You know, I, you may be making fun of Squirrel Girl not selling, but it sells great on digital. And they'll use that as a kind of an excuse, and it rarely is true. But there are cases where trade sales or digital sales or scholastic sales or things other than the floppies were far more powerful and more popular than the floppy themselves. And the best example of this, of, of Marvel's comics, is Moon Girl. Moon Girl did extremely well in a collected version and on digital and with the deals they did with Scholastic for Moon Girl. So even though the comic was selling dog shit numbers, and it was, the comic itself was quite profitable for Marvel. It did well. It was successful for them. They made, they made money off of it. Not like 1980s Jim Shooter money, but still good money. Enough that you, know, you, would, you definitely would go in on that investment. Now, it did start to cool during the end. I mean, like anything else, you know, they published a couple books. And then the flaw kind of in the monthly comic to trade model is that, as you see, like with Dogman, Dogman puts out two of those books a year. And so eventually you're not putting out enough content to keep the, the brand active. And there was no Moon Girl cartoon that could be tied. There are a bunch of reasons why it starts to cool, but it made money. And that's fair game. I, I've seen some comments lately in some of these videos going, well, that's cheating. It's like, no, it's a business. It's, I mean, it, it's not cheating. Their, their goal is to make money, not, you know, not, not, not sell comics in one particular way. Now, you as a reader might want to read comics in just one particular way, and that's totally fair. But if you're Marvel, if you're DC, if you're Image, your goal is to make money, however you make it. So if you can figure that out, good for you. But anyway, that, so that, that hopefully that's a decent answer around, you know, what, what comics need to do to break even. That's kind of the game. And, you know, I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a muddled game. I mean, the, the problem here, I think, and, and this is kind of my observation, having watched the various conversations go on over the last couple of weeks, comic books are not necessarily what people think they are. Meaning, I think a lot of the people who you see talking on YouTube or, or you know, on Twitter or, or in the comment section is this very video, their view of comics are, I go to the store, the comic store, I buy a comic, I pick it up, I take it home, I read it. That's the comics business. But in reality, the comics business is something else. It's, it's that, but it's many more things as well that may or may not impact you. So that can be pretty irritating because you think you're reading a story of some character you have some attachment to, but really you are you know, connecting with a corporate brand and a IP property that is being farmed out in many different directions in order to make a corporation money. That's, that's what's going on. And, you know, by the way, as a capitalist, you know, more power to them. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this system, but it does make for kind of confusing moments from time to time. So anyway, hope that was helpful. Thanks for writing. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and thanks for listening.